Uh, we're going to work with three passages. Uh, the Ephesians passage will be from chapter 6 in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Uh, so if you'll open your Bible to Ephesians chapter 6. This is commonly called the armor of God. And in this section of the epistle, he is concluding, summarizing, bringing together under the imagery of the Roman soldier, bringing together some stuff he has said in chapters 1 through 6, and uh, kind of finally saying, let me put it together in this pictorial form, and he is reviewing or summarizing some of the themes he has developed. Okay? Um, you will read this week that when we approach a passage, the first thing we're going to do is study the passage. And this is a long process. You have looked at resources. You're going to look at commentaries. The goal is to say, what is God saying? And this takes me the long, a long time. Depending on how many verses I'm dealing with, uh, it can be anywhere from six to ten hours. Uh, this is a fairly long passage. You, you're going to pick two or three verses for your first message. So that limits how much reading you'll do. Uh, for my sermon next week, I'm doing the entire 17th chapter of 1 Kings. And that's 24 verses. So there's a lot of reading, if, especially if I'm going to read, you know, a whole bunch of uh, commentaries and journal articles. A lot written on that particular section. It's such a big section. And this is in your textbook. You don't need to copy this down. It's in your textbook. Uh, this is what you'll read this week that we break this large section down into four smaller subunits. First, what is the surrounding context in which your passage lies? Which means you read paragraphs ahead of your passage, paragraphs after your passage. You want to be able to locate your passage within the author's flow of thought. If you lift it out, there's a danger you will do something different than what the author intends and means. Only as you see his progression of thought can you have confidence that your passage is going to, you are approaching your passage correctly. So you read through several translations and you read a chapter ahead and paragraphs after. It doesn't take you too long. Then once you've done that, you're now ready to look specifically at your passage. You have a general idea of what it's about. But as you start looking at it, there are things you don't understand. You flag those. Okay? Why does he say this? Uh, in the king's passage, Elijah goes to a widow up in Zarephath. Uh, the Lord says, I've commanded a widow to take care of you. He gets to the city gates. He sees a woman picking up st sticks. He says, will you get me some more? How does he know she's a widow? Okay? Uh, she seems to anticipate him. Uh, these are the kind of questions. How, how does he know that? Uh, so there are things you don't understand. You, you, you know, why Zarephath? Of all of the cities in, in the territory of Zidon, Zidon, why pick the city of Zarephath to go to? There are reasons. Uh, study will bring those out. I, you know, and so you, you, you identify the questions. You flag the things that you don't fully have a handle on. Then you are ready to use your skills and your resources. Uh, I translate the passage from the original languages, whatever uh, helps, language helps you use to make that happen. And then you're ready to spend the hours in reading those who have given their life over to understanding the background, the culture, and the language. Uh, you look at the good commentaries. At the end of this process, you will come to a consensus. Here is what the author is doing. You will be able to think your way through his flow of thought. Now, let's see how that happens when we come to the book of Ephesians. Okay? And I've given you on your notes, what is the context for when we get to the end of the letter, chapter 6? Everybody divides Ephesians, chapters 1 to 3, chapters 4 to 6. Everybody's division of the book fits that. Chapters 1 to 3 are the calling that we have. We are one new person in Christ. We're not Jew, we're not Gentile, we're not male, we're not female. The middle wall of partition has been broken down and God has brought us together out of the disparity of the human race into one person in Christ. This is our calling, chapters 1 to 3. He will even talk about, if you have heard of my ministry of this to the Gentiles. Now, this is the calling that we have. Chapter 4 begins, verse 1, I now urge you to walk worthy of the calling. 
And so now we are going to enter a section on how does this calling show up as we move through the major areas of our life. And the word walk, which is the Greek word peripateo, we have an English word peripatetic, meaning somebody who wanders around, who walks around. The Greek word peripateo will appear frequently as he moves from one area of life to another to identify the walk. And I've given you some idea of that on the first part. There's a walk in unity, a walk in love. When we come to chapter 6, verse 10, he is going to summarize all the things he has said under the form of an armor which enables us to walk in power against the enemy we will have. And he will talk about who the enemy is and how if we will do what he has been talking about in the previous chapters, and he will use the imagery of the armor, that this will enable us to stand powerfully against the enemy that he has. And so in summary, this is an exhortation to put on the spiritual armor uh, that God provides so that we can live strong for the Lord. All right, let's read it, and I'll be reading out of the NIV, so in subsequent weeks, uh, bring an NIV, and you'll be right on track with me, okay? Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, let me summarize, let me review, let me bring to the conclusion, all right? Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in His mighty power. If that's going to happen, it means you're going to have to put on the armor that He provides. Put on the armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Because that's who we fight against. Our struggle, it's not against a human adversary. Our struggle is against flesh and blood. It's not against flesh and blood. Our struggle is against rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world. Our struggle is against spiritual forces of evil that exist in the air around us. They inhabit the realms above the earth. Since this is our struggle, therefore, verse 13, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you will be able to stand against these adversaries and after you have faced them in battle, you will still be left standing so that you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, you're still standing. All right, specifically, stand firm then. And now he moves into the pieces of armor, according to what the Roman soldier wore. Stand firm against these adversaries. First, with a belt of truth buckled around your waist. Next, with a breastplate of righteousness in place. Third, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Now right away you got to look real carefully at the language. Your feet, you don't have your feet fitted with the gospel. You don't have your feet fitted with the gospel of peace. You have your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And right away we say, I don't understand. That, what, what distinctions is he making? What fine calibrations is he? There's an exactness to his thinking. And so you would flag, what in the world is the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, as opposed to simply the gospel of peace itself? Okay? Now we want to be real exact with what the biblical author and then on he goes, in addition to all this, above all, maybe on top of all, the Greek uh, phrasing is capable of any sort of language along those lines. Uh, in addition to all, I think above all, because when you understand what he's saying, this is something that went above all the rest of the armor. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, because you're going to need that to extinguish the flaming arrows that the evil one is going to shoot at you. All right, I'm going to break it off there. Because you can see from the notes on the top of the first page I gave you, I'm only covering verses 10 to 16. This sermon does not cover the entire armor. Let me tell you how this sermon came into being. 
There was a time some years ago when I was helping out a pastor of a mega church. The church had five services and that was too much physically for him to do. And so he asked if I would share the preaching with him while they were looking for somebody full time to come on their staff who would do that. And I said, be, be delighted to. And so he would take three morning services, I would take two evening services. Because he wanted to be pastor of the whole church, sometimes he'd take the two evening services, I'd take the three morning services. And that way he kind of, you know, had exposure to the whole congregation. But he got to pick the books and the passages. Of course, he's the pastor. And so we preached our way through Ephesians, which was good. We came to the end and he said, now let's cover verses 10 through 20 as the final sermon. And I went, hmm, no. I didn't say anything, but I went, hmm, that's too much. I can't do it. I got seven pieces of armor there. I mean, it'll take me three minutes to describe what the Roman soldier wore, let alone to start talking about spiritually what does that represent and how does it look like in our life. You can't cover it in three minutes. Now, I didn't say that to him because he's the pastor. So I accepted what he said, and then in my passive aggressive way, I went out and did what I wanted, which was, and you will see that this sermon is basically a focusing on the enemy, which occurs in verses 10, 11, and 12. There's a lot about him. And then it focuses most of all on the shield of faith. I wanted to pick one piece of armor that I could handle well. And it, I, it, it, I think the shield of faith is the most important one in there. And you'll see why in a minute. Now, I will cover the three in front of the shield of faith, but very briefly, because when I'm preaching, I can't just skip over and everything. Why are you skipping? When I got through with the shield of faith, nobody said, are you quitting? It, it, it was a 40 minute message already. I think they were, they were ready for me to quit. And they thought maybe he'll come back next week and finish it, and I never did, because we went on to something else, and by then they forgot it. But I, my, my, goal, my goal was, I want to deal with the enemy because in our American culture, we don't seriously perceive that we have an enemy. We theologically know that it's true. We believe in Satan, but we never account for anything in our life as due to him. He never becomes a reason or a factor in our thinking as we move in. And so my goal was, first of all, to, to you know, get him out from beneath the radar and out into the open, so to speak, so that we really started taking the fact that he seriously can't affect my life. And then to talk about the shield of faith in a meaningful way. What does that mean and how does it look? What does it look like to take up the shield of faith? So that's where we're going, all right? Now, if we go and say, okay, I understand what Paul is doing in this final section. He's working his way over some things that he's talked about. He has talked about love and he's talked about truth. Uh, he's talked about the unity, he's talking, you know, uh, okay, he's kind of summarizing these things. Uh, so I understand generally that this is my armor against the Word of God. But let's go back now and say what are some of the things we would flag? What, aren't, what kind of floated by us and we didn't pay much attention to it, but when we went back and really thought about it, we say, I don't know what he's talking about. For example, we are to take our stand against the devil's schemes. Now, if somebody asks you, well, what are the devil's schemes? You'd say, I don't know. See? So right away, are you going to talk specifically about what the devil's schemes are, or are you going to be vague? If you're vague, it won't register with people. It just, whoosh, vagueness doesn't stick. Okay. So what are the devil's schemes? Well, as you start studying, it will occur to you, oh, if I need a piece of armor against something, that must be a scheme. So if I need an armor of truth, the devil must have some kind of scheme related to untruth. If I need a piece of armor for righteousness, there must be some scheme that the devil has which is contrary to righteousness. So yeah, okay, that, you start figuring out what the devil's schemes are because we're going to protect ourselves against them. But initially you might not catch that, and so you want to say what the devil's schemes, okay? Now you come to verse 12. Our struggle is not against human flesh and blood adversaries. Our struggle is against, and now you get a fourfold description of the demonic forces. What is the significance of a fourfold description? Are these different gradations? Is this some demonic hierarchy? 
are some of these guys generals and others are majors and corporates and, uh, you know, like C.S. Lewis's uh, screw tape letters. There's a junior devil and a senior devil and there's this, you know. Who are these four individuals? Are these territorial? Do some of these have rulership over certain sins like pride or what? Do you have an explanation for why Paul has a fourfold description? Okay. Then Paul says there's a day of evil that is coming, verse 13. When the day of evil comes, you'll be able to stand. What day of evil does he have in mind? What, what is this day of evil? Is this Armageddon? Is this eschatological? Is this some prophetic? Or is this the day that Satan comes to try to get me to do evil? You see what we're doing. There is a careful attention to the scripture which is surfacing where I need to exactly understand it if I'm going to preach it. Because if I don't have answers to these kind of things, I'm not preaching the word of God. I'm sliding by, I'm going off tangent, I'm saying something incorrect, because I don't understand what Paul is saying. And so this is pinning down what my study needs to surface. Either my study in the original languages, or hopefully the commentaries will start giving me some answers. This is what I don't know when I get started, which is what my listeners won't know when they first hear it read in church. And what they're going to be wondering about. And so this is what I'm pinning down. Now, when you come to the armor, you have three questions about every piece of the armor. The same three questions. Your first question is, what function did this piece of armor have for the Roman soldier? He wore this in battle. Why? It performed some usefulness to make him effective as a soldier. What did the belt do for him? Okay. Because somehow Paul likens that belt to some Christian area with the sense that it will function in the same way that the belt functions. So you got, you got to start with understanding what was the Roman's belt like? What function did it do? The Roman soldier had a breastplate. What did that breastplate look like? It did not look like the English breastplate of the knights, who when they were jousting in tournaments and they came thundering down horses and hit their lances at each other, it bounced and broke off of a solid piece of metal. Was that the Roman breastplate? No. The Roman breastplate was designed entirely different. It was to perform a different function. So your first goal is, what did the Roman soldier wear? And what useful was that? The second question that you're going to ask us, when Paul says a belt of truth, when he talks about truth, is he talking about the word of God, the truth? You must know the truth. You must know the Bible. You must know doctrine. You must know theology. Is he talking about doctrine or is he talking about behavior? You must be a truth teller. You must be one who in all situations can be trusted to tell the truth. That same question when you come to the breastplate of righteousness. Is this positionally the sanctification, the breastplate of Christ's righteousness imputed to me? Is this doctrine, the innocence of Christ in exchange for my sin, a breastplate of righteousness? Or is this behavioral? You must be one who will act righteously in every situation. You have that question about every piece of armor. There is a gospel of peace. Is this peace between me and God? The peace of sins forgiven, salvation secured. Or is this the peace between me and other Christians in terms of harmony and unity and getting along with one another? And on it goes. Okay, so the first question is, what does the Roman soldier wear? What function did it have? Second question, is each one of these pieces of armor doctrinal or is it behavioral? And whatever answer you come up for with one of them, you have to be consistent all the way through, obviously. The third question is, 
whatever I come up with, how did Paul attach that Christian function to that piece of armor? He will talk about a helmet of salvation. I understand what the Roman soldier wore. I think I understand what salvation is that he's talking about. Why did he put helmet with salvation? Why is it not breastplate of salvation or belt of salvation? Why isn't it a helmet of truth? Because my mind thinks of truth. No, it's a belt of truth, a helmet of salvation. So, so you, 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 one helpful question is, why this piece of armor with this Christian function? So these are the kinds of questions, all right? You get to the shield of faith. Uh, faith in what? Faith in Christ as my Savior? Or faith in something else? What is the flaming arrow? Paul just says, you're going to get, the devil's going to shoot a flaming arrow at you. Uh, you got to be able to have the shield of faith. So he obviously has something very concrete in mind. He has a particular faith in something that will somehow stop this flaming arrow. What's the flaming arrow? Well, he doesn't identify it. All right? How can you go about identifying what Paul had in mind when he said what the flaming arrow is? So we are reading our way through. We are flagging things. Then we're going to go, page two, and we're going to start looking at the Greek. Uh, we're going to translate it. Uh, slow ourselves down word by word, go through it, get the nuances, see the vocabulary, look it up, uh, notice the grammatical connections, see the word order, which will tell us emphases of thought. Uh, I was stunned in, in uh, going, translating through uh, 1 Kings 17 uh, that the English translation does not reproduce, and the NIV does not reproduce the same vocabulary as it appears, and yet in narrative literature, it is the reappearance of vocabulary that somehow shows you the thread and the theme that the author is, is after. Uh, uh, God says, I have commanded the ravens to sustain you. And he says, I have commanded a widow to sustain you. And the widow becomes one who sustains Elijah. And the NIV has three different words translating all of that. Uh, the word devar, the word of the Lord, uh, in the mouth of his prophet. The word devar, the word of the Lord came again, the word of the Lord came again. At the end, the woman says, now I know for sure that the word of the Lord in your mouth, it is true. Uh, the word of the Lord from, is, is an inclusio around the chapter. And uh, so going through the original languages will lift out uh, some of the things that you might slide, uh, not see in the English. Hopefully good commentaries will point this out. You know, I, I think that the good commentaries will call attention to that. Okay, uh, but in going through this one, uh, the word schemes, we wrestle against the devil's schemes. Uh, the note there, uh, that was a very uh, crafty, insidious kind of word. Schemes, it's very, under the radar, under the radar. You won't spot them. If you don't have the armor on in advance, when that scheme hits, you're toast. You're, you're not ready for it. You won't see it coming, and when it hits, you'll be, you'll be done for it. If that armor is not on in advance, you won't stand against it. Uh, the word schemes, the struggle, powerful word, our struggle. Uh, it was the word that was used for a chokehold around somebody's neck, trying to induce a comma, a coma, death. It's a, it's a death struggle. Now, I don't think Paul is saying that you can lose your salvation, but Satan can neutralize you spiritually. He can absolutely make you useless. And the Bible recognizes that. There are some people who sin it becomes so problematic that God takes them into heaven. Uh, they are too much of a problem for him on earth. Uh, they're an embarrassment. Uh, there is a sin unto death, uh, First John says. Paul writes about that because of certain perpetual sinning at the Lord's Supper, some of the Corinthian believers had died. It was, that was the extent to which their sin had taken them. Uh, so this is what Satan's after. That's the struggle. Uh, the word shield suddenly makes you realize the Roman soldier had two different kinds of shields. Uh, the first kind he had was what we would call the garbage can shield. You know, when we were kids, we held a garbage can and we had a wooden sword and we banged on the tin of each other. That's not the, that's not the, gar that's not the shield he's referring to. He's referring to a door shield, something a little bit bigger than the top of this desk, a plank of wood, maybe a couple of planks, depending on whether what they could get. 
bound together by a strap, first of all laid over with leather and then a metal strap or something to holding it, the leather and the wood together. The leather was treated with oil. This was a door shield. And as the Roman soldier lifted that door shield above all, in addition to all, and as he joined with others in the corporate battle, and as they advanced as a phalanx unit against the city that they were coming up against, the archers on top of the city wall, when they let go with arrows that they had dipped into pine pitch tar and had set on fire and were shooting down, those arrows hit the oil and slid down harmlessly. If they weren't, those arrows would nullify any of the other armor Paul had already mentioned. And this becomes a critical interpretation. Paul understood above all, in addition to all, because if you don't have this shield of faith, whatever it is, the other armor won't do you any good. And part of your preaching will be to show how is that true. If the, pit, if the arrow got into the belt area, it would soon eat away the visceral area. If it got into the shoes, it would burn his feet. He wouldn't be able to walk. If it got into the breastplate, which was overlapping pieces of metal, very flexible for a foot soldier to be able to turn and to get to battle on all sides, but still able to provide him with protection. But if, a, if an arrow pierced through some of that overlapping metal, it would burn and kill you on the inside. It would burn right in the way. And so Paul is saying that the shield of faith, whatever that is, has to be protecting. And so as the message develops, we will say, all right, what is the belt of truth? How, what does it enable me to stand against it? But how does that belt become vulnerable if I don't have a shield of faith over it? And all of a sudden, we're flagging all kinds of stuff to say, all right, now I'm trying to get a handle on this passage. Uh, so by the time I get through with that, uh, I have, after six, seven, eight hours of just studying and reading the best resources I can get my hands on, as I start to say, all right, what is my understanding of Paul's flow of thought? Then I come out with something like the results of study, okay? This is my understanding, all right? Uh, it's kind of even a quasi outline. You can see I've got a couple of left margin stuff that says we must put on, uh, and the first hunk has to do with the enemy we have because that's Paul's first flow of thought. Here's our enemy. And then after he's thoroughly talked about the enemy and the enemy's uh, abilities, then he will say, now put on the armor. And so right away, I know my sermon has two big hunks. It's got one hunk that will deal with the enemy, another hunk that will deal with the armor. Now in the enemy, Paul seems to describe this enemy with three features. He will talk first about how he comes very schemingly against us. There is a an intelligence, there is a cunningness, there's a deceitfulness, there's strategies he has. Uh, so that's one factor that I'm going to develop. He talks about a death struggle, a chokehold. So there's a hostility. The goal is to destroy us, uh, to make us spiritually impotent. And he talks about a power that he has. Uh, there's a fourfold description of his organized cosmic evil forces ready to carry it out. I mean, Jesus says he is the prince of the power of the air. He is the prince of all of the powers that are in the air. John writes, the whole world lies in the lap of the evil one. Satan has been doing this stuff for thousands of years. He kind of knows you. He's had a couple of billion people to practice on before he ever got to you. You're not going to surprise him. He's got you wired. He's very carefully been watching you. He's around all the time. He's got somebody around you. And if you've got a weakness, he knows what it is. And if you've got a weak time, he knows when it is. And he'll wait, and as soon as their weakness combines with your weak time, he'll hit. And if your armor isn't on, you haven't got a chance. We have no conception of our vulnerability to this enemy. He rules this world. Now, he cannot do anything that God does not permit. 
But God gives us the resources, and we must avail ourselves of them. We must put on the armor of God to resist him. And my understanding of the evil moment is not eschatological. It's this is the moment when he will center his attack on me with some evil intent in mind. The day of evil is a unique day when he comes at me to sin. Okay? So I must put on the armor of God. I understand each of the pieces to be behavioral, not doctrinal. So it's a belt of truthfulness. Uh, it is a belt of being a truth teller. This fits the best understanding consistently with all the weapons. It also fits Paul's review of earlier things he has said uh, to do not let the sun go down upon your wrath. This is why we have to have feet that go with peace. Uh, he, we, he start, we are to speak the truth in love, so we are to be truth tellers. These are echoes of things he has said earlier in the chapters. Okay? Uh, the belt for the weightlifters, it was like what you see in Costco. Uh, again, the checkers that have that lift the heavy stuff out, or Sam's, or if you see weightlifting on television. It was a wide belt that provided stability, strength uh, to keep that thing. And, and you can see I go on identifying uh, what the, the breastplate was overlapping, small squares sewn into a leather vest, allowing flexibility. Uh, the breastplate of righteousness is that we must act righteously. The feet fitted with the readiness from the gospel of peace. The gospel brings peace between us. The middle wall of hostility is broken down. We are at peace with other believers. That is a function of the gospel. I must be ready to carry out peace between me and another Christian. I cannot guarantee it. That's why I am simply ready to do it. This echoes Paul's words in Romans. As much as it is possible, as much as it lies within you, live at peace with all people. Sometimes you can't control the response another person will make. They may determine, I just choose to separate myself from you. But on my part, I am ready to always come to you and say, can we talk? I've offended you. What have I done? Or let me tell you how you wounded me. You may not have intended it, but you need to know it because it's bothering how I relate to you. I am ready to go to any Christian and to talk it through. And on we go. We get to the breast, we get to the shield of faith. And first we have to identify what the flaming arrow is, and then we can figure out what kind of faith will help me against the flaming arrow. My best understanding of the flaming arrow is it is doubt that God intends to be good. This seems to be where Satan started in the Garden of Eden. Can you eat anything? Yes. You sure? One thing we cannot eat. What is it you cannot eat? Well, there's a tree where we get to decide what good and evil is. God won't let us eat that tree. God says he's going to decide what good and evil is. The, the knowledge of, the identification of, the labeling of good and evil. That's God's. We don't get to do that. Ah, God knows that if you eat that tree, you will be like him. He doesn't want that. He's holding out on you. God isn't letting you be all you can be. God's not working your side of the street fully. You see that same attack when Jesus is being tempted by Satan. You're the son of God. You shouldn't have to go hungry father would not feed his kid. God is not being good to you. You've been 40 days. Okay? Doubt in the goodness of God. That seems to be Satan's attack. And that makes sense because if you doubt the goodness of God, every other armor will give way. The breastplate of righteousness. If you're single and all of your friends are getting married and having sex, and you're not getting married, and it doesn't look like it's going to happen, and you're saying to yourself, am I going to go through all of my life and never have sex? Well, if God's not going to provide me with a spouse, I guess I've just got to look out for myself. And if you doubt the goodness of God in having somebody for you or in determining a life of holiness without it, if you doubt the goodness of God, the breastplate of righteousness will, will soon disintegrate. 
if you're having a terrible time with finances. It's just a great struggle. And your insurance, car insurance premium comes due. And you say to yourself, I don't have enough money to pay my car insurance premium. And then you look on the sheet and it says, how many miles a year is this thing driven? And you see that up there, they have you down for 25 to 50,000 miles a year. Yeah, that's probably about right. And then it occurs to you, wait a minute. If I get a different number up there, a lower number, that'll lower the premium. Obviously, the less miles you drive, the less risk you are to the insurance company. The less. So you call the insurance guy up and say, hey, I don't drive 25,000 miles anymore a year. I only drive 10 to 15. He says, oh, okay. And you say, will that affect my premium? You know it will, yeah. And now the belt of truth has given way because you doubt the goodness of God. God is keeping, is just not coming through and funk giving me the finances I need. And so you begin to see that when Satan can get us to doubt the goodness of God, all of a sudden our other commitments become very weak, fragile. Because if God, if I don't have God, nobody else is working my side of the street, I better take care of things myself. And so that's it. So the faith becomes faith in the goodness of God. The shield of faith, the Lord is good. All the time, the Lord is good. The Lord is good all the time. The Lord is good. And that affirmation, that assertion, that conviction will carry you through almost any set of unfavorable circumstances or situations. God is good. He designs, he has laid hold on my life for good, for eternity, and to conform me to the image of Christ. Romans 8, 28, when it says that God works all things together for good, it does not mean God is going to make everything in your life come out hunky-dory. It's not a Joseph equivalent. Don't ever put Genesis and Romans 8, 28 together. Joseph said, you meant it to me for evil, God meant it for good. In that situation, God was taking their evil and making it come out in a beneficial, positive, helpful way. That's not what Romans 8.28 is saying. Romans 8.29 goes on to define the good that God is working toward. In all sorrows and tragedies, God is working for the good of conforming you to the image of his son. God will take any situation. God will take a traffic accident that leaves you in a wheelchair. There is nothing good in life about that. But God will work with everything and use that to further conform you to the image of his son. That's his goal. His goal is to make you like his, his son, not to make your life happy. And he will use all things. Now, he will make your life happy too, but that's not what the interpretation means. And so when we say that the Lord is good, the Lord is working good in my life. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.